Hey there everybody, this is Antonio Wolf. Just running a quick errand, so uh, I'll make a quick video. Uh, one of the philosophers that I have a really weird relationship with uh, is uh, Schelling. Uh, Schelling is uh, considered by most just to be the stepping stone uh, predecessor to uh, Hegel. You know, there's the usual Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel movement, and then obviously, you know, most people seem to just only care about Hegel. Uh, hardly anybody cares about uh, Fichte, though uh, it seems people care more about Fichte in the English-speaking world than they do about uh, Schelling, though in Germany, uh, obviously, these get uh, far more far more light than they do in uh, the English-speaking world. Uh, but anyways, uh, I read a little bit of, uh, of both, actually, uh, of Fichte and Schelling. Um, and I don't know, you know, you, you would think that in part I would hate it because Schelling has a way of going about things that is just so antithetical to Hegel, uh, especially once you get into the later Schelling. Uh, for example, like, you know, um, the Schelling that would, people think Hegel is usually refer, like, um, referring to is uh, usually the period of Schelling which is uh, concerned with the so-called identity philosophy, uh, which is uh, Schelling's uh, big attempt to uh, go past Fichte, and, uh, you know, he has this between that a development of uh, two modes of philosophy, uh, one is the mode of idealism, the other one is uh, of uh, naturalism or dogmatism, or realism uh, rather. Uh, and uh, if you look at what's going on in those, uh, it's kind of hard. <laughs> Schelling is probably one of those philosophers which is actually probably hard to read, um, partly because Jesus Christ Schelling is not a very good writer, uh, not a very good writer for the most part, uh, you know, he uses in the identity philosophy a really weird and uh, obnoxious to me a formalism for presenting his arguments, uh, but there is a reason to his arguments and there is logic, so, you know, there's logic to it, you can comprehend it, once you comprehend it, you're like, oh, okay, you know, that's why he's doing these things. Uh, but there's a book um, mo where most of my Schelling knowledge comes from. First off, my, uh, my direct uh, knowledge of Schelling comes from reading uh, the uh, Freiheitsschrift, uh, which is uh, the, free, the essay on freedom, uh, shorthand, both in German and, and in English, because the actual title is ridiculously long. It's yeah, German autism. Um, and uh, it's a book, the knowledge I have from that is that most of that I consider it to be garbage, honestly. Uh, not that there isn't anything philosophical to be gotten from it. There is, you know, I have to admit that much. Uh, if you've ever listened to Zizek, Zizek loves to talk about the uh, Umgrund and the Abgrund uh, and all these other things, and those come uh, from around that essay's development and you know, stuff from that carries on. Uh, but if you read that essay with no background into what Schelling is doing, uh, which is a uh, Bemian background, coming from Jakob Bema, or Buma, however you pronounce it, a lot of that doesn't make sense. Uh, not that it can't make sense, because believe me, uh, the first time I read it, I read it with my friend uh, Hyperion, and uh, we both were g going like, you know, the first... 15 pages, 20 pages of the essay are really good, you know, they go into like, this deconstructive argument about uh, this whole issue of uh, monism and dualism and spinozism and, uh, you know, can we, can we have a philosophy of freedom that can uh, overcome these limitations of systematicity uh, while still keeping, you know, that systematic and, you know, singular principle character, uh, things like that. Uh, and it's a very good, very clear discussion. You, you read that, and uh, even if you have no background and all these other things, uh, it strikes you that, yes, you know, these are very important issues. Very interesting. 
But then he goes on into this weird, mystical, religious cosmogony uh, about a certain development, uh, you know, all the way up to living spiritual beings, uh, elements of, you know, an unconscious god or, you know, the Ungrun, then, you know, the conscious god. And uh, Shelley's trying to deal with these uh, issues of, you know, how can God be good, perfectly good, and, you know, uh, still there is evil in the world. And so Shelley says, well, no, God is, is completely good, but, you know, uh, God isn't actually this... Uh, all-encompassing uh, character that we usually uh, think of it to be, uh, and uh, there is necessity for evil, for darkness. Uh, you know, in the pure, within the, the world of pure light, and so there's this dialect between the darkness, the the, the umbrun, and the and the light, which is reason uh, or love, and it just gets weird. You know, you can make sense of it, but it just gets weird. Uh, I really don't, I don't like that sort of metaphorical style of argument, even though, let me tell you, um, I think more people should read uh, Fichte, particularly artists, because Jesus Christ, that is a fucking great metaphysics to uh, put in the background of your stories. You know, if you're gonna have a world designed around something interesting, design it around Shelley, because it's fucking, <laughs> it's, it's good. So, like, for, I'd say probably two-thirds uh, of the essay, I just, there was some, there's a philosophical argument going there, but it's deeply hidden within these metaphors uh, of this cosmogony. And um, I, I just felt it was too religiously tied, you know, that the way the problem was set up was already a problem of religion and not a problem of philosophy. Uh, that, you know, that only if you believe in something like the Christian God, uh, do you have to, you know, make this account of the Umgrun that, you know, the perfectly good God, you know, it's still God, but not the full God. Uh, you know, it's not the totalizing God, but it's just, it's still worth calling God. Uh, and then us, and trying to explain, you know, why God isn't blameworthy for, you know, the evil that exists in the world, but nonetheless, evil is necessary for freedom. Um, and to me, that's just nonsense. Not a question that I'm interested in at all. Uh, although, the, the second time I tried to uh, finish that essay, because the first time I read it, I only got about halfway, and then uh, me and Hyperion uh, took about a year and a half off and to, uh, you know, just cool off, and uh, we, really, we really didn't like Shelley. <laughs> we had this thing about, uh, you know, it seems to be Deleuzians and Shelleyans and Whiteheadians come together, and uh, those are three types of philosophies which I tend to have. Uh, negative feelings towards, negative views towards, uh, not really because of uh, the philosophers themselves so much as the followers of this, these kinds of philosophies. Uh, the followers do not live up to the masters, that's for sure. Uh, but the second time I attempted to read uh, The Freiheit, you know, um, even reading that stuff that I didn't like and that I thought was so hard to grasp the first time because of its metaphorical na nature, uh, if you pay attention to what's going on, it's not so bad. You know, even if you don't know your Jakob Bema, makes sense. Uh, so then you finally get out of that and you get to back to the problem of freedom after uh, Shelley has developed his cosmogony. Um, and there's about like 20 pages left, or rather more like 10. And Shelley gets to the core of the problem. And he, he phrases the problem so clearly and so beautifully that you're like, yes, that is the problem of freedom. You know, like, that, that is the problem that uh, in standard philosophy, as far as you understand, as far as you've known, if you don't read these uh, great systematic philosophers of the past, you wouldn't understand that that's the issue. That the issue is about how in the hell does self-determination amount to freedom? There, Because there's a sense in which it obviously must. It obviously does, you know, because if you're not being determined by something else, uh, you're only being determined by yourself. Uh, and then you ask, well, then how do I, how am I free in determining myself? But there's a, there's a bootstrap problem. There's a bootstrap problem because then if you're indeterminate, there is no possible choice to be given. Uh, there's no reason at all that you could give for why you would choose anything over anything else. 
Uh, you couldn't say, oh, well, I like that better. Well, there's no no determination of likes. Uh, and, you know, why do you like it? And you can't give a reason. Uh, and so in order to actually be free, you must already be determined in such a way that you're trying to be free. And the way you become free is trying to come to terms with uh, your limitations in relation to the limitations of the outer world that resists you. Uh, but then, you know, this makes this whole issue of, you know, libertarianism versus determinism, uh, incompatibilism or compatibilism, uh, become a lot of nonsense. You know, if you want to really peg that into the modern lingo, uh, Schelling would be in Schelling, Fichte, Hegel, and people like that would be a compatibilist, but compatibilist of an unrecognizable sort, because uh, for them, it's not that, oh, well, freedom is compatible with determinism. No, freedom is determinism. Uh, it's self-determinism. Self-determination. And, uh, yeah, and, and Shelley ends up phrasing that, but uh, he doesn't find an answer. You know, he, he brings up the question in the starkest way possible, and it just strikes you, and, you're, and it, you know, if you, if you really get into those problems, it really bothers you uh, deeply. Uh, because even... Uh, even with knowing, uh, well, or having the intimation more correctly, that it seems Hegel has an answer for this. Um, I haven't read that answer, and so, you know, uh, it's in the back of my mind. How can he answer this? Uh, there's a really formal way in which you can make the identity. You say, oh, okay, well, yeah, that works. Uh, there's another way in which you can't, uh, because the element of choice is weird. Uh, the element of choice uh, is there for Hegel, and there is there for Schelling. Uh, and so it's not just simply this matter of just uh, be who you are, which, uh, to go back to the book that I mentioned, uh, the book I'm talking about where I'm getting more most of my information from, uh, besides the Freiheit, is a book called Schelling's Philosophy of Freedom by, I think, Alan White. It's a very good book, uh, very easy to read. Uh, I think that's about as good an introduction as you're going to get uh, uh, from anybody, uh, not that it's the best introduction, but I think that it, as far as introductions go, the style of it is pretty good. Um, you know, it doesn't require you to get someone to have so much background. It explains to you the builds ups, uh, and yes, he goes into generalities and it goes through the entire eras of Schelling because Schelling was a philosopher who was kind of sort of famous for uh, changing his mind quite a bit. Uh, and I think Alan White. Uh, does a really good job of showing no you know Schelling didn't really change his mind you know so much as he he kept rephrasing things uh, to try to clarify what he was getting at uh, to try to get at uh, at something new uh, and the way Alan White uh, poses the opposition say for from Schelling to uh, to Hegel is uh, uh, White says that Hegel is a, you know the choice of philosophy uh, in favor of ontology that uh, philosophy is going to be about the intelligibility of things, pure categories, uh, but you know, uh, by the way it's designed, it can never actually explain uh, the real things um, in terms of real things. Uh, and when I'm saying real things, I'm talking about what you would call the existent. Uh, Schelling brings up the existent in uh, uh, in the Freiheit. It's a it's a very unique notion in which he says, you know, when I'm talking about the existent, I'm not just talking about the category. You know, I'm, I'm talking about the the thisness, the thatness. Um, you know, I think he calls it the das. Uh, and it has, it's like sublation, you know, it's it's one of those German words which has so many connotative meanings. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, so anyway, um, Alan White goes over the uh, the kind of background that leads to Schelling, the kind of problems Schelling is dealing with, uh, how Schelling is trying to solve the issue of freedom. And, and Schelling, you know, does change his mind in the ways that he conceives freedom, but he, his project is always one about freedom. Um, anyways, uh, so Hegel's ontology, Schelling chooses theology uh, in a philosophical sense, not because of religious uh, things. Yeah, although Schelling was very spiritual, very mystic, very religious. Uh, he was in, very into that kind of stuff. Uh, and so there's the identity philosophy in which uh, Schelling ends up saying, going with uh, sort of a Spinoza bent and says, well, you know what, we solved that uh, freedom is necessity. Uh, bam, uh, you know, <clears throat> and that leads to a lot of weird things. Uh, I mean, it leads to Schelling, like there are quotes in the book of Schelling just kind of going, uh, if you ever heard of the weird thing about Kant, for example, when Kant says, uh, 
that he that if a murderer comes to your door and asks for your, your where your friend is, you know, with the intent of killing your friend, um, it's wrong for you to lie. Uh, you know, you have to tell the truth. And obviously, that is fucking crazy. <laughs> you know, that's that's just not reasonable. Yeah, you know, as far as logic goes, yes, you can understand why Kant says it, but as far as rationality goes, you know, concrete rationality, that is nonsense. Uh, and Schelling ends up saying similar things, not just to that, but uh, for example, Schelling would say that um, everything is free insofar as that it is what it essentially is. Um, and uh, everything is what it essentially is already. Uh, so, you know, if you are born with uh, a desire to just murder people senselessly, uh, that you enjoy torture and all these things, uh, you know, your good is that. You know, that is what you should do because that is what you are. Uh, and nobody can stand back from a moral framework and judge you for it. You know, any judgment that seems to say that you are defective or that you shouldn't do these things um, is misunderstanding that, you know, goodness is fit to what you are. And if you are a murderer, well, it's good to be a murderer. <laughs> so Shelley would say, well, you can't judge Hitler because, you know, at least Hitler was good at being Hitler and that's what Hitler was supposed to do. Obviously not, not an acceptable ethics, uh, that's to be sure. And so stuff like that um, results from from about the first period of Schelling. As far as I remember, then he goes through these shifts between, uh, he's first mostly influenced by, uh, by a, by a, a pseudo-Fichtianism, uh, and then actually imposing Spinoza more on, on Fichte. Uh, and then he kind of starts switching around and he starts being more influenced uh, by Plato and Leibniz and uh, his arguments begin to be more Leibnizian than Platonic. And he actually tries his hands at some Platonic dialogues. Uh, you see some of his arguments and uh, they're definitely Leibnizian. Uh, and by the way, there's a section on that book, I think it's in chapter 2, uh, where uh, a little bit of the Leib Leibniz background is explained and oh my god, it's it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I haven't read Leibniz. I need to read Leibniz. Uh, I should read Leibniz. I want to. Uh, it's just so hard to read alone for me. Uh, to me, reading is a social activity and, uh, you know, learning philosophy is a social activity. Uh, so it's very hard for me to just sit down and just uh, read things alone uh, and just, you know, scribble down little notes and uh, write little articles for myself. Uh, it helps me a lot to just have somebody there who's attentive and who might raise questions or who might feel that I should be explaining something to. Uh, because it helps me think quite a lot more. Uh, but there's a, a bit about uh, Leibniz and the concept of finitude and infinity. And uh, I don't quite remember the details, but I it just blew my mind when I read that. And I said, that's genius. You know, these people were geniuses. Uh, absolute geniuses. Uh, so anyways, uh, that then leads all the way through the meanderings of the Freiheitsschrift. And uh, finding out that Schelling made the Freiheitsschrift on purpose nebulous nebulous and difficult because uh he was kind of pissed off that uh, when he had wrote, tried to write clearly with the identity philosophy apparently everybody misunderstood him although i think that's kind of a a falsehood it's rather you know he didn't want to own up to uh, the strange things he had said <laughs> so he decided that he will write something that only the most dedicated and ardent believers and students who really wanted to get the essence of the truth uh, would work through and never figure out and you know the rest of the people would just uh, say oh Sheldon's just crazy uh, but at least that's all they could say. Um, in a way, there's a sort of a smartness to what he did. There's an intelligentness. Uh, because what he did was... Uh, he wrote unintelligibly on the surface so that people could not even pretend to know what he was actually saying. So they couldn't go around and say, oh, Schelling is saying such and such because they had no clue what Schelling was saying uh, from the mere appearance of the text. Uh, so all they could say is like, oh, Schelling's gone off the deep end, look, he's crazy. But uh, they could never tell you, oh, Schelling believes X, Y, and Z, like people do with Hegel, for example. Uh, and it, you know, that causes so much more confusion. It's a, such a much bigger bastardization. And, and Schelling just kind of wanted to avoid that. So in a way, it's 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 smart if that's your goal, I suppose. Uh, it's stupid if your goal is to, you know, leave a lasting impact on thought. Uh you know, we'll see who's uh, who remains in the future. Although, you know, uh, being honest here, uh, I think Schelling is definitely going to be one of those philosophers who's definitely still read in the future. Unlike, 
modern philosophers, uh, you know, uh, I find it hard to believe that people like Deleuze, for example, will be will be really looked back on and uh, read widely uh, simply because uh, their style is just not really amenable to uh, you know a changing uh, cultural landscape. It's too tied too tied with uh, the moment of history, too tied with a, a tradition, and uh, you know uh, probably what will remain is uh, you know the secondary literature on these philosophers, which was clearer than the philosophers. Um, and which obviously will never fully capture the originals, uh, but most people will probably just remember those uh, rather than than say something like difference or in repetition, uh, uh, difference in repetition. Uh, but anyway, so that book meanders long, and um, it's a good read. Uh, there's a lot of there's a because Alan White is also Hegel scholar. Uh, there's a contrast between Hegel and, and Schelling, but you know he doesn't judge Schelling according to Hegel. He just kind of goes into uh, you know, tries to portray to you what Schelling is doing, try to explain to you why this makes sense, you know, what he was trying to do. And in the end, you know, Schelling's uh, final philosophy is what it's called, you know, the... Um, uh, real philosophy. Uh, uh, there's a negative philosophy, which is purely theoretical, uh, and real philosophy has to do with the actually existent. Uh, and uh, particularly, um, Schelling seems to call his uh, final real philosophy a uh, metaphysical empiricism, uh, which does not mean <laughs> uh, what you would think it means, although it does mean something that you might think it means if you were clever uh, to think about it in that certain way and knew what it was for, um, which means that you take the empirical, you take the existent, and you take your negative philosophy and uh, you look through the historical record of existent things that are known uh, and you match them up and you say ah here's where my theory meets this and so long as the order of things in history and the world you know matches relatively with the order of things in your theoretical philosophy your negative philosophy um you're good you know that's that's pretty damn good you know, you've got a philosophy then that uh, you can be as close to being certain that uh, you're describing something real. And, you know, when Schelling finally, uh, when Hegel died and Schelling started teaching in Berlin, he tried to put this out finally, you know, uh, to a bigger audience. Um, nobody cared. Uh, nobody liked it, you know. Um, it, it's actually quite sad uh, because Schelling never solves his issues. Um, you know, the weird issues of freedom always remain for him. Um, you know, whether it bothered him or not, uh, I doubt it bothered him. Uh, but uh, one thing that I, 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 at the end of that book, I just felt sad. I felt sad for Schelling because uh, there's a little anecdote about uh, the people who went to Schelling's, you know, inaugural lectures when he first became uh, the professor uh, replacing Hegel at Berlin. Uh, and, you know, the first lectures, you know, excited everybody because here was Schelling, you know, just barreling down the, his, the history of philosophy and specifically gunning for Hegel and, and saying, I'm going to offer something for the ages. I'm going to offer something that nobody else has offered before. I'm going to offer what you've all been looking for. And what what Schelling ends up offering is a religious philosophy which is so fantastic that the normal average person and the person who's interested in philosophy and you know the real world just ultimately could not accept. Uh, it, it just seemed something so far out there that uh, there was no reason uh, to go that way. Uh, and uh, who were those students? Uh, part of those students, uh, Bakunin, <laughs> Engels, Kierkegaard. People like that. And uh, they remained for, uh, you know, they were excited by the first lectures because uh, Schelling was promising a real philosophy about real things. Uh, and, you know, this is the, this is, uh, you know, kind of the post, uh, post Feuer, like a little bit all along the times where Feuerbach was, you know, be kind of uh, going places. Uh, and so people were, in, people were tired of, you know, abstract philosophy. You know, Hegel was famous pro not for abstract philosophy, but rather because, uh, uh, people saw use for it, even though Hegel didn't uh, portray it as something useful. Uh, 
you know, people were trying to use it for, for interesting things. Uh, whereas Schelling's philosophy just ended up being a flop. Uh, it was, you know, uh, coherent for itself in the way that uh, it was functioning, uh, but it just didn't live up to expectations. Um, and, you know, you read uh, Kierkegaard's, you know, diary about how disappointed he was uh, after, you know, Schelling actually got into his own philosophy and uh, how, uh, uh, you know, uh, he was going to seek answers for philosophy elsewhere. You know, he was hoping, uh, he had come with the hope of studying under Hegel, uh, but, uh, you know, Hegel died and then Schelling replaced him and then Schelling makes these great, awesome lectures at the beginning, um, which, you know, are edging really, really close to the existentialist uh, issues, which Kierkegaard is going to be interested in later on, uh, but then just totally ignores it. And so, you know, Schelling is somebody <clears throat> uh, that is worth looking into, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Fischer is somebody worth looking into as well. Uh, I've read uh, a bit of the Wissenschaftler, The Science of Knowledge. Um, I think it's like the first the first or the second edition of that, that great work. Uh, and Fischer is also somebody who just kind of suffers from being accused of uh, writing incoherently, writing uh, very weirdly, and uh, changing his mind constantly because he wrote <laughs> something like 30... 30 versions of his system uh you know always trying to attempt to get at what he was fundamentally uh trying to communicate uh another thing is uh Schelling is a, though to us he's not famous for that for the most part you know um he's actually there's a, the current Schellingians as far as I'm aware are mostly interested in his philosophy of nature uh, and his philosophy of nature is uh, something I don't know very much about. I know that Hegel was definitely aware of it, and Hegel wrote uh, openly attacking. When he wrote his own philosophy of nature, he wrote it openly attacking uh, Schelling. And so, you know, some some uh, friction there, obviously. Um, it's strange, you know, they, they uh, when they were talking philosophically, these guys were just bitter enemies. Uh, you know, they would just flame each other. Uh, and, and just call each other wrong. And uh, apparently, though, like before Hegel died, uh, a couple years before, uh, he and Schelling actually just accidentally met met at a bathhouse one day at a sauna, I think. Uh, and uh, according to uh, the records uh, from each, uh, they just had a really good chat, you know, like good old friends from college as they were. <laughs> That's pretty amazing if you ask me, you know, to, to have such a bitter rivalry and that uh, you know was so strong that uh these two basically you know once they split philosophically like they never really came together to uh, hang out ever again uh, even though uh in the background they always kept sort of this open channel uh if one of them ever wanted to talk to each other uh, you know they didn't hate each other as a matter of fact uh hegel uh, kept you know uh um use uh, Schelling services, therapeutical services, because Schelling was a sort of a, a psychologist at the time too. Uh, would, Schelling applied his natural philosophy uh, to a lot of things, and there were a lot of people uh, who were into that, and that's why uh, Hegel attacked Schelling uh, so much, because uh, Schelling was actually, Schelling's natural philosophy really was a, a really dominant and big deal at the time uh, in the popular culture of intellectuals uh, in its particular sphere. So, um, what I want to really say overall is, uh, Shelley is somebody that, uh, you know, just as far as conclusions go, I just despise, I despise him. As far as the methods go, I'm not a fan. But as far as somebody who I admire and respect and think that they were a really deep thinker, uh, worthy of your study, worthy of uh, figuring out what was he doing, why was he doing it, and uh, that this may lead somewhere. Uh, hell yes, I think so. Yeah, you know, I think Shelley was great. Uh, despite all my misgivings about his followers and the weird things that you know people believe and the weird things he did believe, um, you know, uh, I suppose I sort of have that same relationship uh, in which, um, despite just uh, having a, an extreme distaste in it, it, I really don't like it. Um, I don't like his philosophy in general. An extreme distaste for that. Nonetheless, I, I find something beautiful and respectful uh, in the fact that he did it, in the in the reasons of why he did it, in following the logic, in figuring out what kind of thinking was going on. Uh, I think Schelling was one of those people who are, uh, you know, he couldn't uh, put together a system to save his life at the end. Uh, 
but he serves as one of the amazing lessons of uh, how far the human mind is capable of going in the search for, you know, the deep truths. And I think that is respectable and I think that is something to learn from. So that's been Antonio Wolf. See you around.